Roll for Crit is made possible thanks to the support of viewers like you and our patrons on our Patreon page. You can become a patron for just $1 a month at patreon.com slash roll for crit. This is Roll for Crit, here with our review of Lost Ruins of Arnak from Czech Games Edition. This is a deck-building worker placement combination hybrid game. You are all explorers trying to find traces of a lost civilization in this uncharted land. You'll be exploring through the jungle, and depending on which side of the board you're using, trying to reach an ancient temple to discover its secrets. Normally, as archaeologists, you'd think you'd all be working together to unravel this mystery, but no, you're trying to prove that you're the best one. This game will take place over five rounds, and each round you'll be going back and forth, taking a main action turn, and as many free actions as you can do if you have the cards or actions to do so. Now, main actions split into multiple things, but let's start off with the board here. You have two workers to place, and if a location is already discovered, that can be one of your main actions, is to travel there to the dig site. In order to travel there, you'll need to spend a card that either matches the symbol at the bottom, such as the foot or the car, or in this hierarchy traveling tree is above it. For example, a car is above foot, so you can use that to go to a foot space, and a plane beats all of them, because it can travel anywhere. No matter how you get there, you'll get the rewards printed at the bottom of that location. Now, you start off with the basic camp ones at the bottom, but sometimes you're gonna want more. That will require you to discover new locations. You can discover new ones either in the middle or the top of the board, and they'll cost a certain number of these compass tokens. Once you pay that, you will flip over a tile matching that area, and you will immediately get the rewards for that area, but you will also spawn a guardian there. These are creatures that guard the place, and if you stay there without dealing with the guardian, they're going to give you these fear cards, which will not only clog up your deck, but will also give you some negative points at the end of the game. Now, in order to stop them, you can deal with the Guardians by overcoming them. Each one has a cost printed at the bottom of their tile, and if you are able to pay those resources, not only have you defeated the Guardians so you do not get those fear cards, but you have earned their respect. You will take that tile and at the end of the game, give you five victory points, but they also give you a little bonus in the top right of the corner, which might be a one-time traveling bonus, or maybe even being able to destroy a card that you have played this turn. I mentioned destroyed cards because this is a deck building game. You will have a basic deck to start off with, but you will be buying cards along as you go. And one of the actions, if it does not have this lightning bolt symbol, it means for your action, you can simply play that card for its effect. Very simple. Of course, you're also going to want to gain new cards for your deck to play on future turns. At the top of the board, there will be a set of cards of two different types, artifacts and items. Artifacts to the left and items to the right. And if you want to purchase one, you can spend the cost, which will be in gold coins for items or in compass tokens for artifacts. Now, as the game continues, each round, that moon staff at the top is going to move over and you are going to reveal different amounts of items or artifacts. So later on in the game, there will be more artifacts showing, while early, the items are gonna be more prevalent. When you buy one of these, they go on the bottom of your deck. You do not have a discard pile. Instead, all of your cards get discarded, shuffled, and put back at the bottom of your deck at the end of your turn, and you'll be able to draw any cards that you bought later on in the game. Another thing you're going to be working towards during the game is progressing on the track on the right side of the board via the research search action. Each player will have a notebook token and a magnifying glass token. You can move either one of those up that track by paying the indicated cost depending on which section they're moving into. The only catch is that your magnifying glass always has to be at or above the notebook. So you're gonna need to move that one up before you can move the notebook. And depending on which one you move up and to which space, you will gain a reward indicated on the side. Could be some resources, could also be one of the assistance tokens tokens down at the bottom. These are special characters. You will be able to get two of them during the game, and during a round, you can exhaust them to use whatever their special ability is. Later on, you may also be able to upgrade them, flip them to their more advanced side, and that will give you a more powerful effect. 
Finally, if you have played all the cards that you want to play, taken all the actions that you want to take, you can pass. You will no longer take part in the round, and once all players have passed, the round ends, that Moonstaff progresses, and you begin again with a brand new round. After five rounds have come and gone, you're going to count all the points you've made from all the different sources, be it the guardians, the idols you've found, and where you are on that temple track at the side of the board, and see who has the most points. This is an interesting game in the sense that because you only have five rounds and you only have two workers, a lot of the actions you're going to do are going to feel like they're going to feel really important. It feels like every action counts. It, you can't take suboptimal. You really got to focus in because you aren't going to actually build up as a huge deck like maybe some other games. You know, you're only going to buy maybe a couple cards throughout the entire game. Yeah, I, I, it reminds me of the difference between, the people often cite between the games Agricola and Caverna, which are so from the same designer, relatively similar ideas. But Caverna is a game where, uh, you know, you can kind of do all different things and all of them will give you points and you're just having fun going everywhere, freedom, getting points. Agricola is like, you have this many things you can do, make them count, and if you don't do them in time, it's gonna be bad. And this definitely is more that kind of a game where, like you said, uh, every choice matters. Everything that you do is very important. You have to really look at the board and decide, what do I wanna do? Because I only have enough time to get like this many resources. So I really have to prioritize. Quick side note, those resources, fantastic tokens. Really love them, and not just the some of the generic gems we've seen that are, I guess, anyone can use. But uh, going back to those, it's really interesting because there's obviously supposed to be a hierarchy of the tablet is not as strong as the arrowhead, which is not as strong as the gem. But weirdly enough, it felt like the arrowheads, at least to me, were they're rarer, but because they're not as rare as the gem, they were more used. Of, they always felt like I need to get more of them. I think you even commented how the one space at the bottom for the arrowheads was the one that made you feel the worst to get because it's like, it's just <laughs> one arrowhead. Yeah, it's an interesting thing. And I'm sure that if people, you know, eventually play this game more than we have and get deeper into the strategies and things, you may find very different outcomes. And it also depends a lot on which types of cards that you get early on and which which assistant do you take, because different resources may be more valuable to you than others, depending on which game that you're playing. The one thing that I find really interesting about this is that in most deck building games, you're, you you have one resource to buy stuff with, and that's always important. In this game, there's two. And in the early game, the coins are really important. And then late game, those compasses are what you're gonna be buying because there's more artifacts showing at the top. And I liked that transition that you had to kind of halfway through the game or even earlier than that, depending on what you're doing, shift your way of thinking and you can't just stick to one strategy all the way through. I do like the idea behind it, but unfortunately, because compasses were also super important for exploring new locations, which means free new actions, getting a bunch of resources, it didn't make the artifacts like, I don't want to spend them there. It just made the compasses like so important. Like maybe I'd want mm. a few money cards, but really in the end, like, yes, I know there's still one item space in the last round that you could buy for just points, but... I really felt like it was all about getting cards that gave me a bunch of compasses so I can explore and get two artifacts and do this. That really, I felt like the power, sh like if it was just there were only compasses were only used for buying artifacts and coins, then it would be a fun little weird power shift. But because compasses were using other things, it just made everything that gave compasses, compasses, wow, I don't know, that seems weird, but so much more powerful. <laughs> I say compass, but I think either is acceptable. Um, yeah, I agree with you that the compasses are definitely really strong. Uh, they're, they're, they're powerful pretty much throughout, and I, I like them too. But you can also use coins to trade in as a wilds to make them airplanes for movement to sections on the board. We should point that out. And you may have cards in your deck that if you've gotten them previously will say you can use coins for something else. So they could have their uses later on. It really depends on which cards come out and how you build your deck. We also should say we didn't mention 
that when you buy an artifact, not only do you get it in your deck, you also get to activate it once for free as soon as you get it. So they are, generally speaking, I think, more powerful. Right. And they have a cost as well, in addition, usually, to whatever's printed on their card in the form of one tablet. And then I, I think the worker, we've talked about the deck building, but the worker placement aspect is interesting too. As you said, you only have those two workers. Now, there are cards where maybe you can draw the workers back and relocate them. But they're very you're never going to. Yeah, they're rare, and you're not going to be gaining more uh, just through normal gameplay. And I, I liked that too. I thought that was a nice, refreshing change of pace, where it feels like so many worker placements are just getting more workers is always the best thing. And if you're doing well by the end of the game, you've got like five or six, maybe you have more than everybody else and you have more options, which can be really good. can also be paralyzing in a totally different way than this game is. Uh, but uh, I th- I think this one kept it simpler. It kept it streamlined and f- you were every round always felt like more or less on the same page as other players in how you were forced to make those decisions. Uh, honestly, for me, I felt like I was for better and worse gasping for air i always wish i had one more worker to do sure you always want one more but i to me that's the beauty of it like to me that's what that is that's what makes it exciting and when you're able to optimize your strategy it feels really good i mean no, no doubt this is a it's not a game that gives you a lot of leeway to work with but i i enjoyed that puzzle of trying to fit your stuff in in the best way possible I, I guess uh, at sometimes it does feel really good. Like, oh, I can I can get away with this. I can do this one extra thing. But a lot of times just like, oh my God, I needed like another arrowhead or another glass and I don't have any workers to get the more resources. So it was definitely, um, I had both sides of it. <laughs> it, it it's definitely an, uh, an adrenaline rush. The other thing I want to mention is the solo mode, which actually sort of relates to this because it's uh, the way it works in the solo mode is you still have your two workers. But the AI player has this deck of tiles, and they get every other worker. So mm. you don't know when they're going to place them, but it really becomes, if, I'm gonna need, if I think I'm going to need compasses this round, I'd better put my guy on that space, or they're going <laughs> to take it. And in the early first two rounds, that really is scary because there aren't a lot of spaces on the board, so they can take it up really fast. By the way, they always go first. So hmm. they always get the interesting get you on the draw. However, I don't know in the modes, maybe just my play style or something. And they always explore two once each around, but by like three and definitely four and five, there are so many locations that those spots are actually, you're fine with all their people taking up space on the board. You're like, oh, whatever, I'll just take that one. And it really is an interesting twist of how like terrified you are at the beginning of the solo mode to be like, I need these things and I can't let him take them from me. To be like, eh, let me just see if I get the points. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. I do think this is a game that is cool as a solo mode uh, because of kind of what you were saying is that th- the more workers you have in play, the more locations are being opened up. So it, I think, roughly is equivalent to the strain of what you're trying to do versus how much is available to you. Crits and misses for Lost Ruins of Arnak. Crits. Over the course of five rounds, everything in this game is tightly designed to allow you to do just enough to succeed from the amount of workers that you receive to the limited number of cards you're able to buy. It's designed in such a way as to make every action count. We've seen plenty of worker placement and deck building games that can last a long time in order for you to really build up your engine. But for this one, you've only got five rounds, so you better make the cards you want and the workers you place worth it. This is a deck building game that keeps your deck small. You don't have a discard pile. You will not be having your deck clogged too much, even by those clogging cards that you will receive. It's a refreshing take on the mechanic that has you thinking in a very different way from other games using that genre. To the way the cards are just randomly put on the bottom of your deck, to the lineup shifting as the game goes on, these are the kind of refreshers we need in the current deck building genre. The value of the different resources changes over the course of the game, whether it's late game, early game, or mid game, depending on which of those cards you may have personally, or which spaces you have access to. There isn't going to be one static use for everything that will change for you and all the other players individually. 
The game has an enjoyable theme of exploring the jungle and finding secrets of an ancient civilization. And to complement that, you've got a really colorful, interesting board to look at with some really nice three-dimensional resource pieces that you can have in your hands, feel in a tactile way, and know for sure what does what, what goes where. It's very intuitive. The components and theme are all definitely top-notch, and hopefully will make your eyes glisten just as much as that ancient golden idol. Misses. While there are many ways to earn points, I wouldn't consider this a point salad game. Usually in games like that, there are a lot of different strategies you can choose to follow. In this one, it's probably more likely that you're all going to try and follow the same one of exploring and make it to the top of that track. If you ignore one component compared to another player, odds are you're going to fall behind in the points big time. Different players may be viewing resources differently or playing different types of cards on their turns, but ultimately you're all moving towards this temple track on the side and you can feel like you're limited a bit. You're kind of forced into one track compared to other games that are more open. There are a ton of resources for you to use to either move up the track, buy cards, deal with guardians, but it does seem a little weird how important some of them are versus how often you can get them. In particular, the biggest issue were the arrowheads, which seem to be rare, but very useful. As we said, this is a tight game. A lot of the mechanics are designed for you to be really focused and make sure each action counts. However, there is a chance where there aren't any good cards for you to buy or any space for you to place your worker that's optimal for you, or even some of those assistants just might not be useful. And it really does stink if you're forced to do a suboptimal play. Sometimes, depending on which cards or tiles are laid out randomly at the start of the game or based on what other players have or haven't taken before you, you're just going to be forced to take something when the time comes. And depending on what it is, it might be useful at one point or another, but there could have been something better for you that unfortunately you just didn't have access to. Because they really designed this game to last only over those five rounds, definitely trim off some of the fat that you may see, for example, in a lot of deck building games where you just keep buying cards for whatever you want until you have like a, a stack this big of cards. But at the same time, it also really made every action in essence count and become feel like you really need to do something important. And I think that's where most of its misses could come from because it does stink if there is some randomness, you know, with what tiles come out, what cards are there. And if you can't get the resources you need to maybe defeat that guardian or to move up on the track so you can get an assistant or even some of those assistants, we just felt like they were ones that are better than others. Yeah, I, I think that that can happen in this game. But I will say in spite of the, you know, we're, we're talking about maybe some of that randomness that could come from which cards come out where, this still feels very much to, to me further in the Euro game camp. It feels like that style of game. The well, I think that's strategy. actually why the randomness hurts so much more for us in general. I feel like when you play something Maybe. like any uh, generic de deck building game, because it's that more American feeling and it lasts longer, you're like, yeah, whatever. I'll, I'll buy the Suicide Squad from the DC deck building game, whatever. I don't have a group of them. I'll throw them in there or something. In this, you can't maybe buy something and just like for... Because you can. You really need to think, do I need this card? And in some ways, that's really fun because, like I said, there are those moments when you're like, oh, if I buy this, I do this, I can get this combo going. Like, you're not going to do the draw 20 combo, but when you do even the smallest thing, it feels really good. Yeah, no, it's, it's definitely a blend, kind of a hybrid of uh, American and European games traditionally, which most games these days are, I think. But yeah, it, it it's takes that deck building, uh, which like you said, is usually, does usually have a lot of randomness and is a, a little more, uh, you know, a little more chaotic. And in some ways it still has that, but because your deck is very, very small, it, relatively speaking, compared to other games, you're not going to be shuffling, reshuffling it a hundred times by any means. It, it keeps you very focused. And I really appreciated the way that it did that. I definitely think this is a game that even if you're familiar with deck building games, like most deck building games, even when they do add new elements and twists to it that change things up, you can still approach it with roughly the same mindset. I don't think you can do that in this game. Like you said, you can't just be like, oh, I'll buy that for later. Like you have to really think about what you're, what you're going after. I just felt like without some of the cards, for example, that could instant kill a guardian, the arrowheads were always like, I want them for this, but also like a lot of the steps on the track 
to move up in the temple need them as well. Like, that was probably the worst ones. The compasses, you can get them fine. It's just they always, like, that's the one I want, like, 10 of, because I can do a whole lot of things with that versus coins. I did have me. a game where I was struggling to get compasses. So, I, you know, I do think it's, there's a, it could, it does depend still a lot on what comes out, which it goes back to everything that we've been saying. But um, overall, my, my thoughts on the game are that I really like it. I feel like this is one of the, uh, at least for me, uh, one of my more anticipated releases of the year. And I really enjoyed it. I think the fact that it manages to get its theme across as well as it does for what I feel like has really the heart of a Euro strategic kind of a game. It, it does everything it sets out to do pretty, pretty well. For me, I think it lived up to the, at least our excitement after game one, because I wasn't ready to be, you know, be on the timer. But once I understood that, it was much easier to know, like, what do I want to get? And because I'm in usual in the deck, like my deck building mindset is like, oh, I'll just buy these cards. You Not were, you, your downfall was that you've played too many of these. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you thought you knew what to do. And this game was like, no, no, no. <laughs> right. And once you on. understand that, it's really fun when you get those moments of like, I did get my little combo going or something, or I got these resources to move up, actually move up. I moved up two whole steps versus like <laughs> one or even three or something like, and plus the components are just fantastic too and with the other mechanics once you understand what you're supposed to do with the game it's 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 great this is also one of those games where every round you're going to have more and more possibilities so like the first oh, yeah. round you'll be like doing like two or three things like you don't have that many options but then by round five you're like you know chaining things and getting resources and workers back and doing all kinds of stuff so it can escalate so there's a lot to explore here and the only way for you to explore it is to check out Lost Ruins of Arnak, which is uh, going to be available soon if it's not already. Uh, and you can go ahead and let us know in the comments if you've had the chance to try it out, what you think about it, you're looking forward to it, uh, where where do you land on any of the issues we discussed as regards resources, difficulty, deck building, anything else? What do you think about the game? You can let us know, of course, in those comments right down below, and we'll be reading them on our next Beanpole Gallery. But until then, I'm Will. I'm Jonathan. And this has been Roll for Crit. Never miss out by liking and subscribing. And you can also check out more on our Patreon. We're also on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and Twitch. So follow us there. 